Hi, this is David Mullen, ASC, uh, Director of Photography on The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, and you're listening to The Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions, and this is The Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals in the video production and filmmaking industries. Today, we talk with David Mullen, Director of Photography for The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. David and I discuss the challenges of filming a period piece in modern-day Manhattan, crafting perfect wonders and long shots, filming at Notre Dame, and much, much more. The Go Creative Show is supported by Rule Boston Camera, Buy, Rent, Create at Rule.com, Hedge.Video, the fastest way to back up media, Shutterstock.com, Magnanimous Rentals, and PremiumBeat.com. Hey guys, so much to talk about today. We've got David Mullen, the director of photography for The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. So we're going to talk about the show, how he shoots it, how he lights for it. Because I don't know if you're familiar with the show, but if you are, you'll know that there are a lot of very long one shots. There's a lot of shots like that, and they're beautiful and extremely well-crafted. Um, but where do, you, where do you hide the lights? Where do you hide your boom? There's a lot going on in those scenes, and uh, they make it look effortless, but you'll be surprised what is really going on behind the scenes to make those shots happen. So we're going to talk a lot about that. And of course, just about how he creates the film, the looks that he's created, his inspiration for it, because it's a period piece, but he's shooting in modern day. So there's a lot going on there. And David talks all about that. Oh, and we have some Go Creative Show news. Now, listen to this. We're going to be doing a live Go Creative Show as part of the Creative Industry Night event series. So Creative Industry Night, it's in its third event. That's going to be happening on Thursday, June 13th. And this one is all about uh, the film industry in the Merrimack Valley and in Boston area. So Massachusetts film industry. Uh, now this is, uh, you can get more information on the event at creativeindustrynight.com. Uh, but what it's going to be is it's going to be a live go creative show featuring Angela Perry, the founder of Boston Casting, and John Stimson, writer, director, editor. We're going to be on a panel. We're going to be talking all about their experience shooting in Boston, Merrimack Valley, and this is a great opportunity for anybody that's in this industry or wants to be in this industry to talk to these people one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, it's a panel, but we're going to open it up to questions. We're going to, they're going to be there for the night taking questions and talking to you guys. So this is an extraordinary opportunity for all of you budding filmmakers to come out and meet titans in the industry here in Boston. So creativeindustrynight.com is where you go to learn more and get information. It's happening Thursday, June 13th at 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. It's a free show and it's open to everybody and it's happening in Haverhill, Massachusetts. So I strongly encourage you guys, check out creativeindustrynight.com and learn more about the event. It's going to be fun. Let's take a moment and talk about Rule Boston Camera. Rule Boston Camera is the place to go to purchase and rent all of your production equipment. It's where I go to rent all of my stuff. In fact, I was just on my Instagram page showing all the behind the scenes of a project that we were doing. We were shooting on Alexa Mini and we had all sorts of gear. Uh, lots of it was from Rule. Our whole lens package was from Rule Lights and all that too. Um, and, you know, the reason that I keep going there is because they have a giant inventory. So anything I'm looking for, they have. So they've got that covered. But I also go there because I get peace of mind when I use Rule. Um, the reason being is because they really care about your project. Now, I know... You know, it's easy to say that. And if you haven't experienced it, it's easy to just be like, ah, doesn't everybody say that? They may. But the truth is, Rule Boston Camera cares so much about your project. Before you even leave with your equipment, you know everything about it. I mean, they're going to give you technical guidance when you take the equipment out on your shoot. And they can they continue to support you throughout your entire shoot. Now, I, I'm talking like that's what peace of mind is all about to me because I'm renting because I don't own. And if I don't own, I may not know all the intricacies of a piece of equipment and having, you know, ha knowing that rule is got your back throughout this entire process is huge. They are committed to our production industry. They're committed to your shoot. And no matter what project you're working on, they make you feel like your project is the most important. And I think that makes me feel good. And that's why I keep going back to them. And I strongly suggest you do too. So head over to rule.com, R-U-L-E.com. Check out their inventory and rent some equipment from them. The experience will be flawless and you will be coming back for all of your productions. So head over there, rule.com, R-U-L-E.com. Okay, let's dive right in to our interview with David Mullen. Mullen. 
So I'm here with David Mullen. He's the director of photography for Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and a whole bunch more, and we'll get to all of that. Uh, but super excited to have you on, David. So thanks for being here. It's great to be here. So I want to dive right in to Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I mean, the show is just enormous. Everybody loves it. It's taken off. It has such a great personality to it. And I think what what gives it that personality is certainly the talent and the music, but there's a lot of very interesting cinematography in that show that give it this kind of feel. Um, and, and I'm so excited to talk to you about kind of how you develop this style and certainly how you execute the style. Um, but I'm curious kind of how this all began for you. Uh, when did you first get involved with this show? Were you there from the very, very early beginning? Yes, I shot the pilot. Uh, and then a few months later, we started shooting the series. I uh, basically interviewed for the job. I got interviewed. I got recommended by Jamie Babbitt, who's a director that works for Dan and Amy sometimes. And uh, she passed my name to them, and they interviewed me, and they hired me. So I, I did the pilot in the fall, and we started the series like in February, March. What was that interview process like? Like, how do you prepare for something like that? That that must have been. Uh, it, it, you know, those types of meetings are so influential and important. It can really change the whole direction of your life. And um, I'm always fascinated with kind of how people feel going into those meetings. How do you prepare? It's uh, difficult to describe uh, a job interview process because to some degree, you come in with certain ideas based on reading the script, but you want to hold your cards before, until you've heard what they have to say because you don't want to be completely off tangent. Yeah. Now, you might have decided, maybe I see this whole show is blue, and then the first thing they said is yellow, and then you suddenly have to rethink everything. So um, I come in with some general ideas, but I first want to get their take on the material so I can sort of build from that. Uh, and this being a period show, the, the number one topic is always uh, what does a period look look like? What, is, what does it mean to be a period show? How does one approach that photographically? Uh, knowing the certain technical limitations, like that we shoot digital or we we have to shoot with this camera or, or this way, um, and you know, on top of that, where are we shooting the show? Uh, things like that. So I, I think our first discussions were really about just uh, the period aspect of this. And right off the bat, they said that they didn't want a kind of sepia tone, pastel, faded period look. They wanted something vibrant and energetic lively. Um, so I, from that cue, I, I sort of started to build my ideas about uh, the way it should be lit um, and how we should keep the camera moving. And, you know, they sort of warned me that a lot of scenes would take place in small locations and, you know, a single moving shot from room to room to room. So I had to uh, have that in my mind as I was uh, thinking about the show. Now, were your ideas that you came came armed with that you didn't reveal because you wanted to see what they, you know, which direction they wanted to go. But were your ideas originally in line with what their vision was? I would say so. I, I think the script has a kind of effervescent quality to it, the pilot script, and it seemed to call for something uh, sprightly, energetic, lively. So I didn't see a kind of heavy Godfather-ish period look to the show at all. Um, so then the question is, then what was the look? And uh, I think being set in the late 50s, uh, I looked at a lot of 50s movies and advertisements to get a sense of what the design aesthetic was. And I had just done an independent film called The Love Witch, which was all lit and shot like it had been made in the 50s and 60s. So I had seen a lot of these movies already in preparation for that independent film. But the difference between The Love Witch and this was that The Love Witch is actually lit and photographed as if it were made during that time, whereas Maisel is not. It, it has the design aesthetics of the 50s, but with a modern lighting approach and camera style. Mm. So you're getting influenced by, now you had said you shot The Love Witch, but very different in, in its approach. But were, yes. what can you point to a couple of films or even maybe photographs that sort of developed this look for Mrs. Maisel? Well, a lot of the uh, advertising photographs I sort of pulled up online. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure uh, what the sources were for that. Uh, but often, you know, you would see a woman in a 
pink dress against the gray background or in a kitchen with a yellow toaster. There was, it was always kind of a situation where the wardrobe was colorful and the setting was neutral or the setting was colorful and the wardrobe was neutral. They were very careful about mixing saturated and desaturated colors so that it wouldn't just be a a wall of color coming at you. You know, you notice a woman wearing a pink dress because she's in a gray office, uh, for example, like in uh, Funny Face, you know, which is a film I looked at um, with Audrey Hepburn. I'm always fascinated by the use of color back in that time period because it's like, it's it's really the beginning of this comprehensive color look. And it's almost like, because we hadn't had color for such a long time, uh, just you wanting to bring out its vibrancy as much as possible. And I think you see that in Mad Men too. Um, and certainly in the work that you're doing, it's like this celebration of color, which I think is such a, uh, such a cool approach to the time period and also the cinematography for it. Did you feel that way? Yes, I think it's all part of a kind of post-war optimism or what I call industrial optimism, where you have kind of these uh, modern office buildings and uh, they're all very brightly lit and their colors are very, uh, I call them aggressive pastels, you know, that just kind of strong pinks or yellows or, or other colors within a more neutral background. You see that a lot in the advertisement, you see it in the movies of the time. Uh, so it's all part of that post-war period where they suddenly had, you know, money and uh, were spending it on color design and movies were more and more being shot in color. I think I'm always been fascinated by early color cinema because color was not a given. Um, designers really carefully thought about the color in their films. Even the first few color films of people like Fellini, apparently on Juliet of the Spirit, he had a lawn spray painted five times in different shades of green until he got the color he wanted out of it because he just hadn't been used to shooting color films at that point. Uh, Kurosawa, the same thing when he did the Uh There's just uh, filmmakers who come out of a black and white background suddenly do color and every color is a very conscious choice because nothing is a given. It's all designed from the ground up. Uh, so that's, those movies are fascinating to me because the colors tend to be very well thought out, particularly in a film like Hitchcock's Vertigo, where this color green is so symbolic throughout the whole story, but it's not just one shade of green. There's a, you know, she drives a pale green metallic car. She's in a, you know, she stands in front of a green neon sign. There's just there's different shades of green that all through that film, but they all are there for symbolic reasons. Yeah, I think that stuff is that stuff is really interesting because I mean, still obviously wardrobe designers are thinking about texture and stuff like that, but it, it almost feels like in in black and white that that use of texture was kind of all you had. You had texture and shape, and you had different shades of black or white. But incorporating color now into this, you know, into the film industry must have been a big shock for them. That's probably, I mean, when you think about the changes in cinema and, and in TV, you know, transitioning from SD to HD and now 4K and beyond, it feels like color is sort of probably the biggest and most impactful of all the changes. Do you think? Well, certainly it was a big change when it was introduced in the uh, 30s and 40s. I, I found an old article in American Cinematographer where the editor wrote an article called uh, What's All the Ballyhoo About Color? Complaining <laughs> about why we didn't need color in movies. And, oh, and, I love that. Uh, you know, he was, he was then complaining. He was saying the color was extraneous to the story. And then he was complaining about a movie called uh, Trail of the Lonesome Pine, which had all been art directed in, in uh, pastels to take away the color. It's a film noir set in the woods. And then he complained that the color was hardly noticeable in the film, which to me was like trying to have your cake and eat it too. He's complaining about color being unwanted. Then when someone tries to subdue it, he complains about it being unnecessary <laughs> if he didn't notice it. So uh, people just did not know how to think about color. Um, there's a good little um, early film book called uh, Film as Art. It's Film als Kunst. Uh, I think it's a German book. And he complains about sound and color the same way. He feels that films were more artistic when they're less realistic. So when sound came along, that was more realistic. So the films became less artistic. And then when color came along, movies became even less artistic. So for him, the uh, ideal 
work of art was the least like real life, you know, black and white and silent. And so there was a certain attitude like that uh, back then. Um, but even uh, with the post-war period when color was becoming more common, c- cinematographers talked a lot about realism and lighting, but what realism was to someone in the 50s was different than what it is today. You, you read articles back then and for a cinematographer, realism is when men are shot to look manly and women are shot to look feminine. That's To them, that's what realistic lighting is because you're bringing out the real character of these people. And it's not about where the light would really be coming from and what the quality of the light would really be. It's, it's more about realism from some sort of a character approach or, or a dramatic approach, but not, a, not a necessarily a documentary approach. So attitudes towards realism kept uh, changing. Someone once said that uh, what's realistic to one generation looks like artifice to the next generation. And I think that's true. You see a lot of the post-war 50s films that were considered the height of realism, and now they look very stylized. They certainly do. And I mean, you really just can't make... You can't make everybody happy. So I can I can understand how someone would be griping about introducing color and in, in, in the way that realism is portrayed. But it, I love that stuff. I would love to see that article. If you have it handy, send it because uh, that'd, be, that'd be an interesting thing to throw in the show notes. Um, yeah. So I can imagine in a show like this, uh, it's a period piece. Your relationship with the production designer must be extraordinarily tight, especially in pre-production. Um, I'm curious. I mean, that's just my assumption, but can you talk to me about your relationship with the production designer in this? Well, it's, it's typical for me to hang out a lot in the art department during pre-production to see what they're coming up with in terms of locations and their, their lookbooks, their, their guides to texture, their historical reference. Often, uh, you know, we, the early part, we're all looking at the historical reference photos and getting ideas from that, um, both in design and, and lighting and what the sort of staging of these scenes were like in, in an office place or a switchboard room or, or other locations. So I, I, I look a lot at what's coming down the pike in the art department in terms of what they're discovering and what they're designing. I think from my aspect, um, there's, it's always about uh, how, how are these locations or sets going to work for camera movement and lighting. Um, and I have to work closely with our set decorator, Ellen Christensen, to have um, you know lamps where I need them to be and, and the types of lamps and what sort of bulbs they take because our shots get so elaborate in terms of camera movement and sometimes the only lighting is the practical lighting that's on the set. So where a chandelier is hanging or where a table lamp is is very critical for me. Yeah, let's talk about those big camera moves. I mean, that's kind of the staple of this show, I think. And, um, and we got a lot of questions about that on on Instagram and Twitter about people wanting to know kind of how you prep and how you execute these long, sweeping movie slash technocrane slash steadicam shots. Um, so let's uh, let's talk about that. T- can you give us give us a little bit of a walkthrough of how you prepare for one of those shots? I'm assuming it's written in the script, so you already know it's coming. Um, what's your what's your pre production process to help you know make that shot work? Well, the script doesn't indicate a shot's going to be a, a one or usually. I don't recall a, a line being like that in the script, but usually it comes down uh, to us pretty early on, or it's fairly obvious reading the scene that it's going to play. Now knowing how Amy likes to stage things, um, that there's not a, really a break in the action that would uh, necessarily. Uh, be covered typically. So you're, you're reading the scene and someone comes through a door and goes down a hall and into the kitchen, then swings over to the den. And, and you don't really see a moment where you would cut from one person and then back to another person. Uh, you could see it playing without a cut. And, and generally, if you can imagine it, it's probably the way it's going to be staged. So I see. So, so no, no, not prepared. a lot of camera direction there, but you can infer that there's it's really only one way to do it. Yeah. Now, the pilot was different in that we had the script obviously very early on, and then we prepped from that script uh, right from the beginning, and and Amy had warned me certain scenes were going to be uh, shot in one moving shot in these locations. So I had far advance notice on the pilot, but when we went into series, the scripts come in later, um, the locations are found later, so everything is a little bit more... uh, 
I wouldn't say last minute because some things were we have more heads up than other scenes, but um, but the pre-production time is much shorter on a TV series for an episode. Mm. Um, but uh, you know, once we find out it's going to be a one then I start having to look for what the how it's going to be done camera wise and how it's going to be done lighting wise, and that requires me scouting the sets or the locations or looking at the blueprints on the set and asking where the lamp's going to be hung, where the wall sconces, where the table lamp's going to be. Um, they'll ask me if I need more or less or where I need to have things built. Sometimes there's a lot of flexibility in a set that hasn't even, it's only in the early stages of being designed. So I can early on say that uh, I would love a window right here and here, and I would love uh, you know, a wall sconce here, and I'd like a chandelier here, and we can sort of design it um, earlier. But other times, it's the set's been designed, and I'll go through and see what they've planned. And, you know, a lot of the practical lighting is part of the design, so I don't want to tell them I need lights here and here and here that is sort of not tied into how they want the set to look from a design standpoint. So, yeah, you know, I'll tell them I need light in this area or this area, but if it's a if it's a crystal chandelier versus a metal china hat versus a uh, you know a floor lamp or or whatever, that's really a design element that that's more um, up to the uh, production designer and the set decorator. I just sort of express where I need the light to come from and the quality of light that would be optimal. Um, so we all work together basically. So how much time do you generally get at one of these locations to? plan that shot out? Well, if it's usually, uh, I might see the location once in, in prep, but then we walk it on the tech scout day with the crew yeah, and we sort of rough in what the shot is going to be. Hopefully I've already figured out how I'm going to light and shoot it. But if not, I have to go back after the tech scout and continue to, to walk around the set and continue to think about the lighting. Um, uh, Often with these very elaborate shots, there's other departments involved, like there's might be choreography with a dance choreographer with extras. Yeah. So there'll be rehearsals in that space before we shoot it, and I'll get to see those rehearsals and and see further where I need a light to be or or where I I won't need a light. So uh, it's just, uh, you know, basically I grab what time I can to to figure it out in advance. Let's take a minute and talk about Shutterstock.com. I've got to be honest with you. I've always been a fan of Shutterstock. They've got so much stuff up there. I mean, I'm looking at their site right now. Over 14 million royalty-free video clips. Okay, so that's insane. Uh, And they always had really high-quality stuff. But if you haven't checked out their Shutterstock Select section, you're really missing out. I mean, the Shutterstock Select is the best of the best. You go to Shutterstock.com, click on Footage, scroll down to Shutterstock Select. And this is where you get premium, highly curated footage that's captured up to 4K by leading filmmakers. They're using cutting-edge gear. They're shot on the latest technology, including RED cameras, Zeiss Master Prime lenses, and more. So it's really, really nice stuff. And and it's simple pricing. You know, all Shutterstock Collect Clips are $3.99. And that includes unlimited worldwide usage. Okay, so you get great quality, you get great prices, and really the best of the best that Shutterstock has to offer. So check it out for yourself over at Shutterstock.com. And big news from Hedge. A couple weeks back, we told you that Hedge uh, bought PostLab, which is huge. And now we're talking about the Frame.io integration. So let me just take a quick step back. Hedge is the backup software for filmmakers that I use and that all of you should be using because it's super fast, it's super easy, and it allows you to import multiple sources and send it to multiple destinations all at the same time. Now, that's important to remember as you're hearing this next part, because if you have Frame.io installed, the the, uh, desktop app on your computer, Hedge is going to automatically detect that, and it's going to put the watch folders in the destination area. So when you open up Hedge and you have Frame.io installed, one of your destinations can be your watch folders. Now, think about this. You import footage and you send it directly to your watch folder. Now it automatically goes up to Frame.io and your editor on the other end can start working with it immediately. Think of the time savings. That is huge news. So this really great integration between Hedge and Frame.io is 
awesome. And I'm so glad they're doing that. Hedge is always updating their app. There's always news going on. The best place to go to learn more about it is hedge.video forward slash go creative show. And that will allow you to get a 20% off discount on the full license. So how about that? You learn, you save, it's all there at hedge.video forward slash go creative show. What are some of the things that you really need to plan for when you're having these large one or shots? And maybe people don't realize, I mean, are there these kind of simple annoyances that get in the way that you've just learned along the way to avoid through past experience? Like what, how do you, I know it, it's probably so simplistic. You're not even thinking in those terms anymore, but I'm thinking from someone's point of view that hasn't really done that very much. What are some of the pitfalls to avoid when you're planning these large one or type shots? Well, you have to think uh, about uh, not only the light hitting the actors from an attractive angle, but the camera shadowing issues. Mm, yeah. You know, so especially if um, we're doing a stand-up comedy scene and there's a spotlight on on Midge, I know that it's going to be very hard for the camera to then sweep in front of her without throwing a big shadow from the spotlight. Uh, I had this same issue years ago and I did this TV show called Smash, which was about Broadway and I had a lot of scenes of people in front of follow spots on Broadway stages. And every time we flew the techno crane around them or, or walked the steady cam around them, I had to figure out what to do about the camera shadow issue. And sometimes it just was a matter of uh, not allowing the crane to cross the uh, beam of the follow spot. And other times it meant switching follow spots in the middle of the scene from the left side of the camera to the right side of the camera and, and beating the shadow of the camera. Uh, other times it meant re-rigging the light higher in the air so that the camera shadow was below the frame. Uh, so there's lots of solutions, but you have to think of this stuff in advance uh, so you're prepared to uh, move a light or, or move the camera or change the lens. So, you know, I'm thinking a lot about three-dimensionally about the space, and if there's a camera moves through it and uh, there's a natural light source there like a window or a lamp that I can't control and I know the camera's going to cross it. Am I going to see a shadow in the shot? Is, am I going to beat that shadow? Is the shadow going to be so soft? It doesn't matter. And sometimes uh, there's a shadow that can't be avoided and I'm, I'm going to have to ask visual effects to uh, paint it out later if it's not falling on anything important. Um, we had a crane shot at night where we swept 360 degrees on a crane arm and I knew almost at any one point that crane was going to have to cross the light because uh, it wasn't a steady cam shot. It was a camera at the end of a large crane. So even if the camera wasn't going to cross the light, the arm of the crane was going to cross the light. And at some point I caught in dailies a, a shadow of the crane and camera at the bottom corner of the frame by the, on the asphalt. Um, but it wasn't crossing over any people. Uh, so uh, it wasn't that hard to paint out and post. But occasionally that just happens, you know, you just, there's no where to put the light, the little camera doesn't cross it. So. so if you were to just describe in general, I know there's each situation is probably a little bit different, but just in general, how many people are traveling with you as you, as you're going through the, one of these scenes, like how many people are actually making that path? In the, well, it depends if it's a movie shot. Generally, you have the movie operator and the grip that's safetying him, and then the boom guy's following uh, the two of them. So there's at least three people almost all the time moving around, even if it's a 360-degree shot, uh, because the uh, the camera operator always needs a, a safety a person safetying them in case they run into something or step off something. So... Uh, and then with a movie shot, the, there's actually a second operator at the wheels uh, operating from a monitor around the corner. So it's a two operator job and they're talking through a headset to each other. With a steady cam, it's the steady cam operator by himself with the safety grip and, and the boom operator. Um, so it's usually always three people I have to deal with. The focus puller is generally hidden around a corner uh, with a monitor. The problem with some of these locations is that there's not really another room to go hide in. Yeah. So I have the, you know, I can be usually down the hall or in another place in the dit cart watching the image on the, in the, on the monitors, but the director likes to be on set. So often the director and, and her monitor is hiding behind a coat rack or 
behind a closet door or behind a couch or, or somewhere so that they could be in the middle of the room as the camera's uh, moving around. Yeah, it's it, the amount of people and stands and wires and cable. When you really think about what has to hide, it's pretty impressive that these shots can even be finished and, and be done. And I'm, I'm looking at it behind the scenes as we talk of one of your shots where there's a big choreographed scene going on. There's a band playing and it looks like that the techno crane sort of drops down and then a movie operator grabs it um, and starts walking beyond that. Am I seeing this correctly? And if so, how often are you making those combinations? Well, that was the first time we tried that, which was a magnet uh, holding a movie onto the end of a techno crane. So we could turn a techno crane shot into a movie shot. It's it's almost a variation of the older technique where the steady cam operator would stand on the crane platform and then step off after the crane move was done. Mm. Um, but the uh, but the techno crane Movi combination is a little more dynamic. You can pull back faster um, and then turn it into a, a moving movie shot uh, by disconnecting the camera with the magnet. It's some it's a rig that Larry McConkey came up with. Who is our, Jim McConkey is our steady cam. A operator and his brother Larry uh, is a city cam operator, and he had come came up with this electromagnet uh, idea. So we used it for the first time on that shot at the Copacabana, um, where we pulled back from the drummer over the heads of the dancers, then switched to movie mode and walked through the tables, following a waiter around, and then out the kitchen doors and into the kitchen. And it wasn't a shot where. You know, Amy said, I want to do a combination crane move and steady cam move. It was just simply, I want to start here. I want to come back to the dancers and I want to go out the door into the kitchen. And so me knowing that there's no way a crane can get to the kitchen door and then be working in the kitchen, figuring it has to be a steady cam shot of some sort. But then the steady cam, how does it fly over the heads of the dancers? And, you know, do we put the steady cam? We could put the steady cam on a platform, but then the steady cam operator would have to be in low mode. So he would just, the lens would just be skimming the tops of the heads of people. But then the trouble with that is that once he got off the crane, his camera's in low mode when it should be in high mode, uh, following someone at, you know, shoulder level. So these are sort of issues that, that then tell you whether or not you can, you should use a Movi versus a steady cam. When you were explaining the amount of people that are, you know, involved in these types of shots, uh, I didn't hear you say that you have anybody holding and moving lights with the talent. Does that never happen? Are you just kind of placing your practicals right in the perfect spots? Or do you ever like carry around a China ball on a, on a boom pole or anything like that? I do often uh, have an electric hand holding a, a fill light or an eye light. I don't usually have to move the key light. Occasionally, uh, in a complex camera move, I may have the key light on a rolling stand or tell the electrics that uh, it should be here at this moment, but then it needs to slide three feet over uh, by the time the camera ends up here to stay out of the shot. So I'll have someone on that light uh, moving it, but that's not the same as following the actor around the shot. I haven't keyed an actor with a light that I've followed around because to me it often looks like there's a light following the actor around, but often I will fill in uh, the actor, because these shots are so complicated, they're often lit from above. It's the only place the light can come from that's not going to create a camera shadow. So there's a lot of soft top lighting, which tends to create shadows under people's eyes or under their hat brim, because Susie is often wearing a cap. So I have to deal with this uh, her eyes uh, being shadowed all the time. So the solution is to walk a very weak, soft light around uh, low under the lens. Uh, so that requires a electric, often with a battery-powered LED light. And then the choreography has to be, you know, I have a 360-degree camera move and a grip and a boom operator, and now I have an electric also trying to stay out of the shot and somehow get the light in near the camera while negotiating furniture and doorways. And sometimes I have to have the electric duck out of the shot and go hide, and then when the camera goes around another electrics waiting with another light to come into the next room and pick it up again. So, you know, sometimes it's, it's two or three lights. I, I've had a few 360 degree scenes on a dance floor where there was no way to get a light 
next to the camera the whole time because there were too, too many dancers in the room. So I had to have electrics hidden behind columns and under tables and inside doorways. And when the camera would pass them, they would join for a section of the dance and then duck out again. And another electric would jump in and pick up the next part of the shot and then and then duck out again. So it's, it's a bit uh, tricky. Do you ever have to just, does the scene ever have to just change? Because something they want to do, you're just simply not able to do. Or have you always been able to you know, give the director what her vision is, but just find a way to do it? Most of the time, I'd say we don't, uh, I don't change anything because it's too difficult. Uh, mm-hmm. There's been a couple smaller locations or scenes where we went in knowing that there was no way I could bring uh, certain lights in. And like when we went to the uh, Ponce de Arts Bridge in uh, Paris at night where Midge is alone or she's on a bridge and she's surrounded by lovers crisscrossing her in the frame, that location, there was nowhere to put condors on each side of the Seine. I had to light that with just small lights on stands on the bridge itself and some handheld lights. And so I, I told Amy that there, she just couldn't do a big 360 or, or even a huge 180 because the lights would be in the shot. We'd have just lights on stands. It's a very narrow bridge. Um, so we had to design the shot so that we didn't look too many directions, basically. And we ended up designing a nice uh, sort of lateral move that was didn't uh, arc around and see what lights I had on stands. So occasionally we do run into something like that where the location just doesn't allow me to bring in where I need to have lights if I was going to do a 360. Where are you shooting this primarily? Are the, is, is everything in New York? Yes, every uh, everything in New York is filmed in New York. We do maybe a third on stages or a half, uh, depending on the script, and then the rest on locations. Uh, we have some permanent sets with like the parents' apartment, uh, Susie's apartment, the uh, gaslight, uh, Joel's uh, loft at the factory. Uh, those are our standing sets. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we build sets now and then, uh, some hotel rooms or sometimes, uh, like at the Catskills, we built the common room set where they have the orientation meetings and stuff. But otherwise, we did the rest of the Catskills episode up in upstate New York. And then we did the big uh, night uh, time dance sequence at a... Uh, sort of factory space in Greenpoint here in Brooklyn. Do you, do you like, do you, I guess, do you have a preference whether you're shooting on a set you built or, or a real location set? Is there something, I can imagine there's something kind of exciting about the challenge of working within a real location, but so much easier on a real set, uh, one that you, one that you've created. What do you think? What's your thoughts? Well, I like both. I think that, a location is exciting when it's something the set can't give you, whether it's the view out the window or it's architecture that just be unaffordable to build or it has a certain history and patina to it or it's a real space, a famous place or something like that. And all those elements that uh, you can't get on a set, um, it's exciting to be on location. I think occasionally you, you do get a, a simple room and you think, well, this would be easier if this were a set. I'd have an easier time lighting it uh, because it's just a simple office with one window, but that window is on the third floor and, and out the window is is a bus lane that uh, I can't park a condor in and, or, you know, things like that. Then you then you think, well, a set would be easier and uh, I'm not really seeing anything out the windows anyway. Yeah. But occasionally there's just, because of scheduling, we have to shoot a scene on location because it's, it's grouped with other scenes on that day with that actor and we can't make a move back to stage or the opposite. We do, we build something on stage because uh, again, uh, we are already on stage for two or three other scenes and we have this one little scene and rather than trying to make a company move just to shoot a, you know, a men's room or something, well, it's easier just to build it uh, if it's, if we can afford it. So it's just, it's just all logistical. There are some sets that are built for practical reasons other sets are built for design reasons, and other times uh, we, we go on location. Um, some of our locations are actually pseudo sets. That, like there's a, an old diner on the Upper West Side uh, that we basically took over for the last few years. It went out of business, and 
it was an existing uh, diner. So we, we dressed it up and cleaned it up and made it a functioning diner again. So it's a real diner, but it's no one goes there. It's just a standing set for us, uh, the stage deli in our story. And the same with the B. Altman makeup counter room. That's a, um, that's a space at the Williamsburg Art Center, which is an old bank building in Williamsburg that we've converted into a department store. But it has big windows to look out on the street. And, you know, so it's really kind of a location. What are some of the challenges that you faced by shooting in Manhattan? I mean, uh, shooting in New York, I'm assuming, is it's, it's just got to be more challenging than LA. I mean, I'm just simply basing it on just the sheer mass of people and the craziness and how compact it all is. Uh, but I'm curious your perspective of it. Like, is that, what are some of the things that people may not think about that can become challenges when you're shooting in the city? Well, you could say that LA is easier to shoot in, except if you're trying to set your story in New York, then LA... Well, <laughs> exactly. You can't, you can't do that. So, well, you can, but it's just a lot harder. You know, you've only got two or three streets and buildings and you're stuck with the same camera angles because you can't uh, look here or there. In Manhattan, our biggest problem is mainly, uh, as you say, controlling traffic and cars, but also uh, controlling what's period and not period. Yeah. You know, if we're on, if we're like in the lower, in the East Village or something, we may have a a block that's completely period correct in terms of the buildings, but the storefronts are all modern stores. So we have to um, get them to change their signage, uh, you know, change the cars on the street. And so in those cases, it, it's very particular where we look and don't look because it just affects how much either art department work or visual effects works involved to get rid of the modern elements. In the pilot, we shot in front of an office building on Park Avenue and a lot of the buildings look modern, but they actually date back to the 50s. They're all part of that Mir, uh, you know, Mears van der Rohe period, international style. So they, they're period correct for our story, but some are more modern than that. And we had a shot where Midge and Joel get into a taxi cab and we panned 180 degrees as the cab pulled out. But across the street on Park Avenue was a modern building. So um, we timed a period bus to drive by just as they pulled out away. So the moment we panned 180 degrees, a bus was crossing and blocking the view of that modern building. Oh, wow. It took a couple of takes to time that out. The bus had to start down the block and just managed to be crossing the lens just as the cab was pulling away. So That's so smart. Yeah, but you can only do that so many times. You can't always have a bus hide something. You know, it gets, we joke about it on set, but it's, it's you know, we do talk about using large vehicles to hide things, but at some point you say, well, it can't always be the same city bus or the same moving van or the same mail truck always across the street hiding something. You know? So it, we have to keep coming up with new ways sometimes to, to mask things. Can you tell me about your camera package and, and lighting package? I'm sorry, camera and lens package and kind of how you came to the decision to use it? Well, we uh, luckily Amazon uh, got rid of their requirement that we shoot with a 4K camera right before we did the pilot. So we were able to use the Alexa on the pilot uh, and we shoot 3.2K uh, ProRes on the Alexas. And that is bumped up to uh, UHD, which is 3.8K or 4K. Yeah. And it bumps up very well. So uh, it it's great to be able to use the Alexa camera because it has such a nice film-like texture to it and, and dynamic range. So in the pilot, we shot with a classic Alexa and Alexa Mini on Steadicam. And we went to series, we just went to Alexa Minis for all the cameras. It just made it easier for the accessories and, and swapping between bodies, not having the two types of bodies with us. Yeah. And we rented from Panavision uh, New York, I just find myself at Panavision New York a lot when I come to New York. They just they often offer the best deals. They they have a great rental house, a great tech people there. So, uh, but once the decision made to go with Panavision, that meant Panavision lenses, um, and I ended up using the Primo lenses on the camera, which I've done many times on other shows. We didn't want a period look from period lenses. You know, we uh, we were going to use a little bit of diffusion on the lens anyway, and that's something that 
and uh, Dan and Amy wanted to do. They just done the Gilmore Girls Netflix show, and they had used the Hollywood Black Magic diffusion filters on that, and they liked that look. So I tested different filters, but they ended up back with the same filter for this show. But knowing that we were going to use diffusion on everything, I wanted to start with a fairly clean, sharp lens. I didn't want to rent like an old flurry lens that had a loss of contrast and then stick diffusion on top of that. So the Primos have a nice crisp look to them and and it combines well with our diffusion filters. Yeah, I think that crisp look is really was a great choice for the for the show because it I don't know, some something about that clean crispness and the boldness of the colors and the vibrancy, it all kind of works together in a way. Like I can't imagine that being super soft and have that same type of sharp, quick wit kind of feel that it has. Uh, it, it seems to blend really well with the tone and the, the just the, the feel of the piece. Yeah, it's a tricky call because we do diffuse everything. Um, but uh, I have to watch the diffusion when we start filming in smoke sets and things because it'll make the effect look heavier. So if, I, if this room is very smoky, then I'll pull back on the diffusion uh, if I do super wide shots, I'll pull back on the diffusion uh, just so that when you want to see more detail, the, the lens is sharper. Um, and we don't do close-ups really on the show. I mean, our tightest shot is generally elbows up or, or waist up. So there isn't a need for heavier diffusion because of doing close-up work. And the lighting tends to be on the soft side. So this is light um, one-quarter Hollywood black magic is what we shoot with like 70, 80% of the time. Wow. And it doesn't work all the time because it does create an interesting halo around lights that can be distracting if the light bulb or, or window is right behind an actor's head. And when we do, we have those situations, I have to switch to a different type of diffusion, something that, that flares less. Like the switchboard shot in the opening of season two, I had them install a bunch of light bulbs along the switchboard console so that there'd be light in the eyes of the switchboard operators. But when I first looked at it with the Hollywood Black Magic filter, every light bulb had a little ring of light around it. And it was a little bit distracting since the bulbs were quite big in the frame. So I switched to a, uh, a Tiffin Black Diffusion effects filter, which doesn't flare really around lights, just softens the image a little bit um, without getting this halo effect. Well, yeah, that makes sense. Cause when you said you shot about 75% with diffusion on it, I, I was, um, it, it looks like it has a little bit of softening on it, just a little bit, but I was, I'm surprised to hear how much because of how many practicals there are. There are bulbs everywhere in this piece. I mean, not even, I mean, yes, in that switchboard shot for sure. And I'm look, I'm actually looking at it right now and I will post a great behind the scenes, you guys, listening at the show notes so you can see exactly how that shot was uh, executed. But yeah, there's, I mean, there's practicals everywhere in the show and it's, um, they're big and they're bold. Yeah. I, the diffusion uh, causes the practicals to glow a little bit and that's usually quite attractive. So we, yeah. we go with it, but it's a subtle diffusion, but there are times when uh, it's just, uh, it gets too distracting. Um, particularly when it's a bare light bulb and, and it's real close to an actor's head or it's very large in frame, then I have to ch change filters. The same thing happened in Paris. I had some scenes with very bright windows right behind people's heads and I went to a pro mist filter because the black diffusion, the Hollywood black magic filter was creating a weird halo around the windows that was distracting. Uh, so I, I do want the diffusion. I do want the glowing and the softness, but it can't draw your eye too much to it. Has, it has to be subtle. You are listening to the premiumbeat.com song of the week. It's called Body Slam by G-Y-O-M. Premium Beat is the place to go to purchase and rent all of your production music. You get a fantastic website where you can access a collection of thousands of royalty-free tracks for as low as $49 each. You don't just get the song. You get cutdowns, you get loops, you get stems. And what that really means is you can customize the music to fit your project perfectly. But it's all about quality, and that's what you're going to get at premiumbeat.com. So head over there and check it out for yourself, premiumbeat.com. And lastly, let's talk about magnanimous rentals. I'm going to magnanimous 
rentals right now over at magrents.com. And they've got a flash discount. They've got a flash discount. What is a flash discount? Well, what is Magnanimous Rentals? I guess let's start there. Well, Magnanimous Rentals is, a, is an equipment rental house. It's in Chicago, but they ship all over the country. So don't worry. They got a fantastic inventory. But what is best about Magnanimous Rentals is their obsession with price. Obsession. I'm telling you, you cannot find a better deal anywhere. With all of these places, magrents.com is the best deal you can get. And just their regular prices are fantastic. But then you add on top of that these flash discounts, which I was talking about a minute ago. These are steeply discounted prices, sometimes 50% off. In fact, I got an Alexa Mini at half price, a half price rental from a flash discount. Now, here's the thing with the flash discounts. They're only a limited time, and they're discounted very, very steeply. But you, they're a limited time, so you got to check every day and take advantage of these discounts. So where do you go? Well, you go to magrents.com, M-A-G-R-E-N-T-S.com. Now, we're talking about Paris, so we might as well dive into this question. Derek M. Davis asked on Twitter, he wants me to ask you about the challenge of shooting the night exteriors at Notre Dame in Paris. Since you can't put light in the cathedral, saying beautiful shots, of course, um, and just wanted to know kind of what your what your workflow there was and what the challenges were. Well, I had a couple challenges. One is that the camera sweeps not quite 180 degrees. It's more like 90 degrees. It looks out across the Seine on, and then pans over to see the Notre Dame. So I was seeing the whole other side of the river and the city beyond. I was seeing Notre Dame in the background at the end of the move. So I couldn't light all that real estate. So I had to shoot at a high enough ISO on the camera that, that I could record that background with available light, mm. which I meant it was all going to be sodium street lamp lit, which is quite orangey um, and not quite period correct. But I figured the warm street lights would just feel more romantic, even though in reality, it would have been white back then, not, not orange. Um, the other problem I had is that Amy had imagined a move in which we start out seeing dancers out of focus in the foreground and the background, and we see Abe and Rose in mid-shot going through these sort of soft shapes that we can't quite make out. And then as we pan with them, we pull back and reveal that they're dancers on the sin. The only way to do that in one move, because it sounded like the opening of the shot had to be with a long lens to get that, that compression effect of the out-of-focus dancers, but the end of the move had to be on a wide angle lens because we had to see the whole river and the Notre Dame, which meant it had to be a zoom shot. So right off the bat, I'm thinking, well, I've got a very low light location with available light and I have to put a zoom lens on the camera. So I had to dig up the fastest zoom I could find, which was a Fujinon uh, zoom that opens up to T2. It's one of the fastest zooms I know of and uh, I knew I could shoot wow, a T2. T2. Yeah, it's a T2, uh, 18 to 90, I think it is. Uh, it's a great lens. It's a premier zoom. It's quite expensive. Um, we used a lot on Westworld when I worked on that show. So uh, I was able to get a hold of one in Europe. Um, unfortunately, it's a PL mount zoom, and we were a Panavision show, so I had to actually rent another Alexa with a PL mount on it so I could put that lens on that Alexa uh, on the crane. So once I found that lens and knew that I could open to a T2, which was very difficult at the start of the move for the focus puller because I'm zoomed out at 70 millimeters at wide open. And we're just seeing Abe and Rose break the frame. So we start out on nothing in focus and then they enter the frame. Uh, and then we zoom out. Once we zoom out, the focus gets easier. But the start of the move, it's very hard to hold focus yeah. on that. And then I had to push the camera to like 1600 ISO, which is the highest I've ever pushed the Alexa for this show because of the brightness of the Notre Dame in the background. The other thing is Notre Dame turns off all those lights uh, like around midnight or, and we were shooting till like one in the morning or two in the morning. So we had to get them to keep them on past midnight, uh, which was, took some negotiation. And then once we land on our wide shot, I had to light the actual dancers uh, on the bank of the Seine there. And the problem was that I really wanted them to be lit from a back direction, not not front flat lit, but back lit more, which meant somehow getting a light over the water of the river. But there was nowhere to put a condor 
opposite on the opposite side of the river that was not too far away. And they wouldn't let me put a condor on the uh, Ile de Cité, I guess, where the Notre Dame is, because the ground where the condor would have to go wasn't stable enough for the weight of a condor. I also think there's a little cemetery there or something. So, so it meant I had to put my condor on the opposite side, on the camera side. Essentially, I had to put the condor next to the camera and an arm out over the actor's heads, over the river, and then point the light backwards, back at, the, back at itself. So we hung some lights off the end of the uh, condor and then pointed them backwards, uh, back at the base of the condor. And I sort of extended it out over everyone uh, just so I could create something of a pool of light on the dancers that was coming from the river direction. But then I ended up still going up on the bridge up the street there with some smaller lights and just putting a rake of light on the bridge, putting a rake of light on the end of the island uh, with the Notre Dame, putting a little light on the path of the uh, river so people walking away from the dance area would still have some light on them. So there's lots of little lights, um, a couple big lights, but then the whole background is just available lights, so, which also meant that the lights I were using had to be dimmed down or had to be at the same level as, as the background. So it was a lot. I was using very big lights, but knocked way down to the point where they're very dim. Mm. And then Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Brady is asking, would love to hear how we managed to film the scene in Susie's apartment when she subletted with an immigrant family. There had to be six plus people crammed in there. <laughs> what? Uh, I, I, are you, is that ringing a bell for you? Do you know which scene she's talking about? Yes, uh, that okay. wasn't one of my episodes. That was shot by Eric Marnier. Um, but I've shot in Susie's apartment before, and it's we built that for the pilot originally because it's such a tiny space. It's actually pretty much unshootable unless you can pull a wall yeah. to put the camera in there. So essentially, uh, we can pull the side wall or the back wall. Um, generally, if you're looking towards the windows, which is generally how you like to shoot in that set, uh, we pull the opposite wall to get the camera in there. And now out the windows is a platform for extras to walk by because it's supposed to be a basement apartment with the windows looking out at street level. So we have a, a sort of sidewalk uh, platform for actors and then our extras, and then we have a backing beyond that. And I'm glad you brought up Eric Moynier uh, because you guys do alternate between episodes. Can you talk to us a little bit about your working relationship and how that, how that works between the two of you? We work closely on scenes or sets that we're going to share you know some episodes have locations that are just a one-off per episode so you know he will get to shoot a place in brooklyn or a city that i'll never get to shoot and vice versa uh, but other locations or sets they cross episodes and then we'll end up shooting both of them and we have to plan together on how those are going to be lit since we have to be happy with each other's choices like the williamsburg art center that got turned into the b altman uh, department store that was over multiple episodes so we planned uh, the lighting for that set very carefully together it just means collaborating you know on sharing our ideas and and what sort of challenges we're going to have maybe he has no night scenes in his episode but i have night scenes in mine so we have to design the set for day and night uh maybe in his he's got a big techno crane move or or i just have his ordinary phone calls in one corner of the set so he has to have room for a big crane. It's, these all have to be sort of talked through and planned together. And lastly, I just wanted to just take our last couple of minutes and get your just general thoughts on the idea of sharing information in our filmmaking industry, because I feel like this is a really important thing, and I feel like you do too. I mean, you co-authored uh, the book Cinematography. It's in its, what, now how many editions is it now? Three, four? Uh, it's... It's its third edition is the one I worked on, and that was the last edition. It's it's a classic textbook that first came out in the early 70s, and then it was rewritten in the uh, late 80s, the second edition. And then the third edition, Chris Malkiewicz wrote it. He was my professor at CalArts. When the third edition came along, he asked me to uh, work on the revision because uh, I was working in the industry, and he felt I was more up-to-date on current techniques. So I did a lot of the rewriting for the third edition. And that's the last edition that was made. And that was published in, I think, 2002 or three or so. So it's primarily a 16 millimeter film book because that was the camera we used in our classic CalArts. So it was a textbook that was sort of meant to go with the classwork. 
but some people still find it useful because it is a basic introduction to film making from a film camera point of view. It doesn't cover digital cameras, uh, but it does cover digital post production and covers audio. Uh, editing, things like that. Well, what's interesting to me about that is, I mean, everybody has an Instagram and yours is fantastic. Uh, but I feel like you have a real interest in sharing knowledge and educating people. And, um, I, to me, I think that that's really commendable. And I, and, and I, I welcome that. I think it's great. I think it's inspiring. And certainly for the people that listen to our show, we're here to learn. We're here to learn from people like you. And, well, um, I, I spent years trying to get into film school. I, I didn't get in at first. And I, took time off after college to just make films on my own and then went to school when I was 26. I went back to school and got my master's in film at CalArts. But I'd been making films for about a decade at that point by the time I finally went to film school. So I taught myself filmmaking by going to the library, reading books, watching movies, and reading uh, American Cinematographer all the way back to the 1920s. I've read every issue of American Cinematographer. I've read every issue of ICG Magazine. I've read most issues of Simpty Journal. I would just go to the library and pull down these bound volumes by decade and I'd read back in time. And because I learned so much, because other people in the past shared their knowledge, I, it felt guilty not passing on what I had learned because this is all borrowed information. You know, it's all stuff I learned from other people. So it didn't seem right to hold it and keep it to myself. I just, I tried to uh, pass it along. Well, we certainly appreciate it. And, and specifically, I was asked by my director of photography that I use for all my co commercial work here in Boston. His name is Chris Lochran. And he had asked me earlier today to definitely let you know, you know, from his perspective, he really values that, uh, that you're able to put that information out there and is inspired by it. So we want you to continue, and I know you will. You don't, you, you don't need me to tell you, but <laughs> I think sharing that information, sometimes you never really know who's paying attention, but we all are and are so thankful that you're doing that. Well, thank you. I'm glad it's useful to people. All right, great. So where can people go to find out more about you online? Well, I have an Instagram page. I just started last year after I came back from Paris. Uh, everyone, when I was shooting in Paris, liked my photos, so I started sticking them on Instagram. Uh, so that's a good spot. I also post on cinematography.com, uh, reduser.net. I occasionally answer questions on Roger Deacon's site. Um, uh, other odds and ends places, but uh, I think cinematography.com is, is a good spot to ask me questions. Oh, I, I should mention uh, there's also cinematography.net, which is the CML, the cinematographer's mailing list. It's an excellent site that I'm a member of. And and it's a it's a site for people working in the industry in cinematography to talk to each other and get advice from other professionals. And it's been a great resource that I've been part of for a long time. And we will certainly put links to all of that in the show notes so you guys can check it out. Well, thank you so much, David, for being on the show. Um, I, I, I don't know much about the following season of Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? I can only assume it's in production and going to be released sometime soon. Is it? Is it true? Are you working on it now? Um, yes, I'm in New York on the third season. We're just starting filming our third episode for the season right now. Anything you can tell us? Anything? What should we expect from this new season? I can tell you absolutely nothing, uh, <laughs> except that uh, I expect to see some very difficult shots pulled off again. Because uh, I've already had to do one on episode one that people will be talking about, I'm sure. Oh, I love that. Well, we'll have to have you back to talk about it when the when the season is released. Great. All right. Thank you Let's so much for being on. We really appreciate it. And thank you for uh, giving us some time, even though you're knee deep in the new season. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I want to thank David Mullen for coming on the Go Creative Show and talking about his career and the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Always great to hear from these guys. And they have such unique experiences and unique perspectives on how they do their work. And I love that. I love that about what I get to do here on Go Creative Show. And I have you to thank. So thank you. Of course, I also have Matt Russell to thank because he mixes and masters and makes this show sound so good. You can hire him for your own projects over at gainstructure.com gainstructure.com and on Twitter at gainstructure and when you're on Twitter you can tweet us at go creative show 
at Go Creative Show. Let us know what you think of the show, guest suggestions. Oh, and whenever we have guests coming on the show, we put a little notice out on our Instagram, our Facebook, and our Twitter so that you guys can ask us to ask the guests questions. And we've been doing that a lot. and It's been working out great. So keep doing that. Of course, I want to thank our sponsors, Hedge.Video, Rule Boston Camera, Magnanimous Rentals, Shutterstock, and Premium Beat. Support those that support us. See you next week.